moment, Bob Dylan's dream, of course, uh, farewell. Okay, all of this comes to a conclusion uh, in my central column in, in 1965, when the British beats and the uh, American beats converge on the Royal Albert Hall for uh, an extraordinary uh, international poetry reading that features uh, um, Ginsberg, Corso, um, and American guests alongside um, the, the leading British beats, um, Horowitz or, um, and uh, Adrian Mitchell. Um, and uh, this is where I first became interested in Dickens presence in, in the early 60s because uh, um, Michael Horowitz is a, uh, an old uh, friend and, and mentor of, of mine who's often talked to me about that particular uh, event. So, um, where, where does this uh, uh, where does this take us in terms of of uh, his experience of formative years in London? Uh, just to to remind you of what um, Carthy says about it, his time in England was actually crucial to his development. If you listen listen to Free Wheeling, most of which was made before he came to England, and listen to the next album after it. There's an enormous difference in the way he's singing and the sort of tunes he's singing in the way he's putting words together. Bob Dylan's a piece of blotting paper when it comes to listening to tunes had an enormous effect on him. So that's a, an interview in The Observer in 2005. Now, Timothy um, Hampton, who's, who's with us today and um, is going to speak um, uh, in, after the break, has, uh, has written about how in, um, uh, has written about the folk uh, the, 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 t the turnstile, as it were, of the folk revival movements uh, in a transatlantic context from the American perspective. And I just wanted to, to um, summarize some of the things that, that Tim um, is able to, has, has, has given me in terms of context. Uh, the left-wing folk circles um, saw folk in the United States as the authentic voice of marginalized peoples. Um, and that coincided with the availability of LPs and therefore of, of the songs of the past being uh, uh, distributed and available to singers in the present. In Britain, there's a slightly different take on that, I think. It's the voice of the people, for sure, but it's also very much the voice of the working classes. And we see this through Ian McCall's, McCall's approach. Um, the voice may restored and made relevant again through collection and participative performance, which is very important in the folk clubs, which are often, often take place in pubs. And it's associated with identity, the Englishness and, and the identities of the nations of the, what are then referred to as the Celtic fringe. Uh, so it's a project. Now Dylan's artistic project, Hampton argues, was to activate the vocabulary of the past while finding his own voice in the present. Uh, and, but when he gets to Hard Rains Are Going to Fall, as Timothy ar uh, argues, he brushes aside tradition. Um, and for a detailed discussion of how he achieves this through poetic language, uh, I would point you to um, Timothy's latest, uh, uh, one of his latest uh, um, online articles, Bob Dylan turned American folk traditions into modern prophecy. So I, I'm not going to dwell on that myself, but what Carthy means by this England in Dylan is London's centrality in the folk song revival in the 60s. So, so it turns around questions of identity, but it's not nationalist or essentialist for Carthy and uh, many of his fellow singers. The traditional songs and singers drawn, uh, drawn from across the British Isles um, and uh, they, they come together, sorry, I'll just come back to that in a moment. Uh, various artists record this Hootenanny in London in, for Decca in 1963. Um, they're drawing uh, many of their songs from the collection that Ewan and Peggy McCall uh, made of, in, of um, English and Scottish folk songs, The Singing Island. But they had a strict policy at the Critics Club where performers should only sing songs from their own country, the English, English songs, the Scottish, Scottish, and so on. And that's a policy which irked Martin Carthy. I'd just like to quote him one more time. I regard Englishness as a thing of identity rather than nationalism and national fervor. I find that detestable, he says. Um, and he goes on to say that he has no problem with the idea of an Englishness alongside a Scottishness and an Irishness or a Welshness, but he doesn't like this idea of, uh, of, a, of an essentialism. 
so Englishness for him was also about overcoming the dreary fare of so much mid-Atlantic syrupy popular music that had invaded the British charts in the 1950s. Um, and it's something he dismissed. So when the Peng Penguin Book of English Folk Songs was edited in 1959, its first edition, uh, it's in response to the sentiment that English national tradition has been, had been neglected compared to American, Irish, and Scottish uh, traditions. Um, that book became a key source for the repertoire of the, of the folk club singers. Now, I'm, I'm going to, because we're, we're running short of time, so I'm going to have to, uh, I think, uh, overshoot slightly by about five minutes, but I want to leave time to questions. So I'm going to jump one or two sections and I'd be happy to take questions to fill in the gaps uh, later on. But I'm, I'm going to jump really straight to uh, this idea of mythical space. How, do, how does what um, Dylan is deriving from this song, these songs, these folk songs that he's learned in London that he might have been acquainted with in, in New York, but essentially that he's taken off to Italy, as Adrian has said as well, to, um, uh, that have inspired him. How, do, how does that relate to this mythical sense of space and place? Well, Ifu Tuana, the humanistic uh, geographer, uh, has a definition of, with two aspects to it. First, he says that mythical space and place is is in the fuzzy area of defective knowledge around the empirically known. So for all of us, it's the unperceived field uh, uh, around our, our field of empiric, empirical knowledge. And that's the irreducible mythical space. It's a hazily known area or unknown area. And the second kind of mythical space is, uh, functions as a component of a worldview or cosmology. So it's a people or a person's more or less systematic attempt to make sense of their environment. Okay, how does this fit in with, with what Dylan is doing? Well, I'd like to, I don't think I'm going to play this song because we're running short of time and, and because of the audio quality, but I would, um, I would invite you, if you're not familiar with it, to, to listen to Martin Carthy's wonderful rendition of uh, Lord Franklin's Lament, which uh, which was drawn from a mid 19th century broadside the, on the fate of Sir John uh, Franklin. So the, uh, the Arctic explorer who uh, set off in the, in the 1840s in the search, 1845 in search of the Northwest Passage and who was uh, lost with uh, his crews in, in that search and the attempts of uh, Lady Franklin to, to discover the fate of uh, his expedition and of her husband. Um, and if we look at uh, the way this is adapted, I've, I've just given you the lyrics side by side. I don't expect you to read the whole thing. I'll just point to one or two elements in it here. It's very busy on the screen. Uh, Bodden borrows the melody and the bare bones of the lyric. He borrows elements of the refrain and recur recurrent lyrical markers from the original, the ghosts in the narrative, if you like. In the original, the narrative eye is that of a seaman, but the point of view switches in the last stanza to Lady Jane Franklin, who moved heaven and earth, including seance of spiritism to find her husband. She even petitioned the American president, offering a reward um, for uh, expeditions to discover his fate. Uh, the narrative I is preserved in Dylan's, but it, it does not vary in the last verse. The trajectory of the narr narrator's waking self is Reversed in Bob Dylan's dream, however, it's not implicitly uh, eastward, uh, but it's uh, it's it's um, it's sorry, it's it's by it's westward, but it's uh, not implicitly northward, but it's by rail, not sea, continental rather than maritime, transposing the song into the geography of the American frontier myth, and we contrast that myth with the English traditions of hymns of loss at sea for those in peril on the sea. Um, where the sailor na narrator of Lord Franklin is homeward bound one night on the deep, Dylan's narrator is a daydreamer, outward bound on a train, leaving his past behind. Um, and that reminds me of David Pachesky's uh, essay on memory and the predominance of the theme of leaving departure, no direction home that Adrian was evoking in Dylan's songwriting. The dream sequence of the middle stanzas is reversed. Bob Dylan's Narrator dreams of the comforts of a northern home forever left in his wake. 
Lord Franklin Seaman of a daunting polar wilderness north by northwest. Dylan's sleeping self is projected back into the common room of past fellowship, a feature of the voyage of the voyage immobile in travel writing, the voyage around a room, the geography of its barest, at its barest expression. So there's no tragedy in Bob Dylan's dream, but there is loss. Just as the waking self can never hope to return to the same place in a dream, the parting of the ways is irremediable, so the song's lament is intact, not for a lost hero, but for a former self and the irretrievable fellowship of youth. The North in Bob Dylan's dream is implicit, autobiographical, and teases the original's maritime theme in the material props of the lyric. The old wooden stove um, weathered, weathered many a storm, recalling the idea of shipwreck. The idea of the North is remnant. It's a Northwest passage of the mind, a lament for the impossible return to the community of youth. I wish in vain. I, I'll never see again, never see again. What was lost at the forking of the road suggests, suggested in verse six, many, many, and one, the longing of wish, wish, wish. And finally, the reward, the reward for um, the uh, uh, 10,000 guineas, which is, is simply transposed into, uh, into $10,000 I would freely give. Uh, Brian Ferry has a very haunting cover version of Bob Dylan's Dream on Chimes of Freedom in 2008. That was originally learned at Newcastle University Folk Club in 64 to 65 at the inception of Roxy Music. And Louis Killen, uh, the singer of uh, the next song I want to look at, The Leaving of Liverpool, um, was uh, the founder of the Newcastle Folk Song and Ballad Club in 1958. Um, so we can, we can surmise why Ferry was drawn to that lament for lost youth. Dylan assimilates the imaginative geography of the folk original and he reorients it, stilling its essence and extracting the timelessness of sentiments that we can all relate to like a polished stone, says Tudor Jones. Now I see we're, we're really running very much short of time and I don't want to curtail uh, so our, our opportunities to ask questions. So I'm going to move very quickly over, over the other songs that I'd hoped to talk about. The Leaving of Liverpool, where you have um, Louis Killen's uh, traditional arrangement of the traditional song adapted by Bob Dylan in Farewell, which is a lesser known song, but of, of course it was eventually released on the, uh, on the Whitmark um, the demos. Um, and uh, here we have a, a very specific geography, much like the geography of uh, Olson's Gloucester. Uh, and what Dylan does is he, he, he really uh, takes, the, takes the specificities out of the geography of, of, of his song, out of the spaces of his song. And he creates a kind of uncertainty principle. Uh, we're not sure if he's bound for the Bay of Mexico, you see in the first verse, or for the coast of California. So sort of truncated California again and again, uh, this idea of, of, of traveling into unknown spaces or um, inchoate spaces uh, emerges in these adaptations. I won't say any more about that for the moment. Uh, and the last uh, song is again, there's much ink has been spilt about Scarborough Fair, so I won't actually uh, comment on that today in here, but I will comment on one element of Boots of Spanish Leather because Adrian evoked its writing in Rome and that's a very useful link I think between our papers. And uh, I was often very quizzical about how Boots of Spanish Leather was supposed to be derived from Scarborough Fair. Of course, the melody is very sim similar, but the lyric is very different. And uh, I was always intrigued by the presence of, um, uh, of uh, these Boots of Spanish Leather, of the, the, the eponymous title, uh, until uh, I came across the Gypsy Laddie, so this, this song that Dylan is known to, in, in recent uh, years, in recent decades, is known to have um, enjoyed playing live on various, various occasions. Uh, and in the, as you'll see in the, in the final, I've just, I've just provided it here. Uh, so in the final verses of, of the song, 
you find the original the the, the, the gypsy laddie is uh, is the ballad of a of a lady who lives uh, leaves her her lord and runs off with a with a gypsy and uh, he attempts to um, entice her back and uh, he uh, he he cannot achieve that but, but at the end um, she prefers as uh, I'd rather have a kiss from the gypsy's lips than all your land and money uh, and those, so as a token a love token so it's, familiar from um, the 17th century onwards, what, what's the, the Lord acquires, what's made of Spanish leather, her high heeled shoes that she hands down to him as a, a token of their parting, in fact. And this is what we find in, at the end of, uh, of in the last verse of, uh, of Dylan's song. So um, um, melodic similarities, but this time the lyric is radically different and there's a syncretic, uh, movement whereby uh, there's a presence of other ballads in, in, uh, in the, uh, the adaptation that, um, and the original that he writes from it. So to conclude, um, I'm going to conclude by saying in, in Dylan's modeling of compositions on traditional songs in the 1962 to 64 five period, what, what, is, what is jettisoned, what is left out, is just as significant as what is preserved from the source material. There are three recurrent features, it seems to me. There's this, both a theme of displacement and an instrumentalization of displacement in the structuring of, in the, in the spatial structuring of the songs. The song narratives are transposed to the spaces and places of a mythical continent, America, to some extent Europe, marked out by the cardinal points, north, the west, south, and a center, the place where I come from called the Midwest, Masters of War. In the same distant places, Richard Elliott sees a poetics of displacement at work in the corpus, particularly for him in Time Out of Mind, that cannot shed the pull of place and the desire for homely permanence. A second feature is neo-toponymy, new names, the grafting of new names onto old places, but they are replaced in Dylan's songwriting, it seems to me, by an elemental sense of place, road and rail, structured around the cardinal points, the north, the west, the south. Olson's geometry of a spatial nature, perhaps, but a strange, almost abstract ge geometry without coordinates. Both of these processes are detectable in folk song variants, of course, albeit frozen in one or another melodic or lyrical form by the more purist collectors and singers. Final feature I see here is a recurrent feature is remnants. The genius loki uh, of these songs is a sort of the elemental ghosts of the old songs that haunt the melody and lyrics of the new, contributing what uh, Tudor Jones sees as this quality of timelessness and, as I mentioned, like a, a polished stone. As a coda to finish, um, and some of you may be familiar with uh, this poem that uh, was given to Ashley Hutching, so the founder, founder member of Fairport Convention, to read at the 50th anniversary of his appearance, of Dylan's appearance at the 1969 Isle of Wight Festival in August of 2019, the so-called Million Dollar Bash. Um, just to give you a bit of context, Fairport Convention had compiled uh, their own, um, or had just issued their own compilation of covers of Dylan's songs, including their only top 30 hit, the 1969 single, very appropriately in French, Si tu dois partir, if you gotta go, go now, in the original. Uh, so their LP had just been issued, A Tree with Roots, Fairport Convention and Friends and the Songs of Bob Dylan. So here we have what I think Tim Hampton refers to as Dylan might be seen as a historical poet. And here we have the poet teasing his own history the history of Girl from the North Country, or is it Girl of the North Country? In some, uh, in some lyrics it's printed as such. Uh, and teasing the uh, genesis of that lyric and the origin, the autobiographical origin of that limit, lyric. Um, he's obviously alluding to Echo Hellstrom, a former girlfriend who died in 2018. As Richard Elliott remarks, Dylan is an artist who very much does look back. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you very much, Matthew, for uh, well, a wonderful and uh, insightful um, and strongly uh, theorized and uh, 
um, very highly detailed uh, paper. Thank you.